when Dr. Nancy Solomon first asked me to be part of this panel, I would have never guessed this is how we would do it, but here we are. I'm glad for the technology that we can still get together and it gives us an opportunity to try and enjoy what we enjoy when we attend the Voice Symposium, especially when we can now try to connect even though we're trying to isolate. We're all impacted in different ways and there's many of you that maybe even have family members who are sick or at risk and our hearts and our prayers are for you at this time. Um, I'm very privileged. I know uh, Nancy was supposed to do some sort of introduction. No, no, assuming it, it went. Uh, I'm just personally very privileged to be part of the Department of Communicative Sciences and Disorders at Michigan State. It's a pleasure to work there. We have great faculty, colleagues, students. It's it's really it's really quite fun. Let me uh, wax historical for a bit. Um, fourth grade, some of you, you think back to your fourth grade and what it was like. Fourth grade was, was hard. That particular year was difficult when I think of what we did to our poor teacher, Mrs. Jamet. Our class, we were awful, so awful that this very good experienced teacher had a, just an awful time with us and ended up losing her voice completely. Unfortunately, she's not alone in this. Uh, the cost of teacher-related voice problems, um, you know, absenteeism, treatment, uh, expenses, et cetera, have been estimated to be $500 per teacher per year. Uh, this is a significant amount of money, and female teachers are nearly twice as likely to have problems. And either, in either case, in all cases, students' learning have been shown to decrease. Um, when you think of occupational voice users generally, those that use their voices of tool of trade, it's about 34% uh, of the population. Teachers are only 4% of the working population, yet teachers uh, represent nearly 20% of voice clinic population. So there's definitely something here to study. Most of the time, one of the comments they talk about is fatigue. So I want you to just kind of um, put your hand on your neck real fast and just kind of do this quick little exercise. This is voice symposium, we do these kind of things. And just do a ha ha ha, three times, ha ha ha. That little exercise, you think your voice turned on three times. Um, and now a teacher, on an average day in the classroom, their voice turns on and off 20,000 times, twice the average of the normal population. Think of a stenographer just typing where each key press is one 20,000 times. I mean, that's a repetitive motion issue, and ouch, that's got to hurt. What about the vibrations themselves? Teachers experience 22 to 3 million oscillations a day in the workday. And you think whether that you have actual collisions or just sheer stresses, it's a tremendous amount of work. If you look at the vibrational standards from OSHA, um, that means that the vocal folds, acceleration and the magnitude they experience could only vibrate a tenth of an hour before exceeding OSHA standards but they survive and they move on. Vocal folds are amazing instruments. Well, it doesn't affect only teachers. Uh, you know, uh, other performers experience it, vocal performers, call center workers experience it. Uh, I'm from Michigan State, I gotta point out Tom Izzo and his amazingly destroyed voice. Uh, it hits all sorts of populations. And even those that don't depend on their voice in a professional way, and there's a nice picture of my youngest being picked, pushed by my other daughter and using her vocal folds very well there. Um, and then there's me, you can probably hear a rasp in my voice. I have a tremendous problem with my voice. I'm always working with it. I mean, it's, and, uh, and not a tremendous problem. I'm always kind of have to make sure I'm aware of it. And this time where I'm spending so much time on the microphone uh, in this modality is, is, is really taxing. 
So when it comes down to it, this happens. Vibration happens. But really, it's a question is how much is too much? Or when recovery happens, what's an, ac uh, an adequate recovery time? And then finally, what factors can contribute to these, uh, especially when you have a sense of fatigue or wear and tear? And can you train resilience? Those are all the underlying questions that will go throughout everything we do. And you hear many references to it. Um, and they depend on other risk factors well, as well. If we look at fatigue itself, so here's a slide that uh, was put together by Mark Berardi, who just recently graduated from MSU. Um, it was my privilege to work with him for several years. And he put down this great slide that showed uh, reviewing vocal fatigue literature and the metrics and how they were, how fatigue was trying to be assessed. And he really showed that when you look at some of these metrics, some studies show them no change, for example. Some have it going up, some have it going down. When you have it going down, it's just all over the map and it's really hard to have, um, have confidence in because of the variability. And that's been something that we've really been struggling with at try as a field generally. And I know me and my colleagues and, and my research group have been trying to figure out how do we reduce that variability so we understand and can treat and track people better. And this led to one of some of the concepts, and that is, are we even using the right ways we describe things and right definitions? So, I want to show you a little bit about a review paper we did um, the, where hopefully we can address some of these issues with some of the groundwork we laid down. So I called up a bunch of friends, a bunch of colleagues, and said, we got to work on this. I have a bunch of students that did a literature review, and we needed to be, have a better set of definition. And so we wrote this paper towards a consensus description of vocal effort, vocal load, vocal loading, and vocal fatigue. Say, but I thought this was a redefining vocal fatigue talk well the, my point is and i'm going to get to that in the end is we can't really talk about vocal fatigue unless we talk about all of these components so i called up my friends and said let's let's work on this together so the purpose of this this paper was this study was to review the usage of these terms and track them a little bit to look at what the bibliometric analysis tells us and then see if we can come up with a a more concise set of definition for the concepts that are conveyed. So we looked at all the major databases and those terms and had you know, lots of students helping us out, pulled out nearly a thousand publications after duplicate exclusions. And then with those 971, we went through them and, and had to reduce them down by looking at abstracts and seeing if they fit, if they talked about animal vocalization, that was different. And eventually we got down to 218, reduced it further by seeing if those terms when they were used were used as definitional or not. Sometimes they were just used as words as they were descriptive of, for example, the Gerber scale or some other assessment method. Finally, we got it down to 130 publications and um, and they were part of our systematic review. So, so this graph is the first kind of result. And it just shows the maturity of the field as we discuss these terms is a term, the, the instance of the terms and their use in the literature goes up and up. Um, and as we're now in a big part of what we do, which also defines how I need to use these terms better. And then we did a bibliometric analysis, which allowed us to see the relationship between the words from the abstracts and the text itself. Very cool little like technology. And we saw that it did focus around four terms and four concepts, which we like because we started with four, even though we we're throwing in lots of data into this. But we also saw that you know, science is organic and there's a lot of ambiguity in these 
there, you know, and, the, and, and which isn't unexpected. Um, but the consequences, the ambiguities can hinder us from moving forward. So what we did is we said, what does the literature say these things say? And so then I'm going to go through a couple of the concepts that the literature puts on this. So for example, vocal load describes it as a per perceptory or, vocal or phonatory effort as being heavy, moderate, light. Um, it talks about vocal loading task as a vocal load. Um, it also says, you know, it is described as vocal load as the amount of vocal loading experiences. But there's a general consensus, um, though not universal, that vocal load is affected by the increase in vocal demand and the consequences of increased vocal load is associated with an increased likelihood of a disorder or some other kind of a voice issue. Vocal loading, on the other hand, is used as its own concept sometimes and also is interchangeable with vocal load. Very di makes it very difficult. Where vocal loading is sometimes just a voice task that leads to vocal load. Vocal loading is, sometimes, is most often described as an increase of vocal fold vibration, muscle tension, negative phone function, etc. Um, but it, it wasn't necessarily clearly defined or nor distinguished, and and they were used interchangeably, which is really kind of difficult as, as we try to go from one being a, a verb and one being a noun kind of thing, a load versus a loading effect. Vocal effort is a multi-dimensional concept. Um, uh, it can usually, it can often be conceptualized as either physiological or perceptual. And that makes it uh, somewhat uh, uh, difficult. Sometimes it follows the exercise science description in our literature. Sometimes it, it is the perception of, I mean, the hearing and hearing it in somebody's voice, where exercise science is always the experience of. And so we have these kind of, uh, of ambiguities. Vocal fatigue, while there's been some great papers done before, um, has, been, was most, has been most commonly defined as a set of self-perceived vocal symptoms, as well as some physiological adaptation following some kind of extensive vocalizing. Um, and there's even a division where one subset talks about the perceptual condition uh, that's going on, and the other one is the acoustic or physiological consequences for voice use. And I know Chai is going to talk about fatigue later but you can see by these there's a they're not well defined i mean their concepts are there but what do they mean? that's what we set out to do we met together lots and when we met together to try to just figure out what what do we mean by all this data from the review we started with the dictionary and we looked at some common terms for example demand where demand is a requirement of work or the expenditure of resources Effort, commonly used vocal effort. Effort as the work or conscientious exertion, work or conscientious exertion. Fatigue, awareness of exhaustion from work, exertion from stress, maybe a temporary loss of ability to respond. Um, or when you have a load as a noun, as a quantity that can be carried, something that weighs down a thing, you know, you could load something. Or you can have it as a verb, where it's a something to put be put on to something else, um, or to receive that load. And then you have the response to all of these. And this is really set up where we wanted to go. Um, now it turned out because historically vocal load and vocal loading were used so much and, and often interchangeably, we decided instead of redefining those and having conflicts in the past, um, it'd be better to just start fresh and that is to have two new terms we're going to say as vocal demand and vocal demand response now uh, these two are not one-to-one -one. you don't go vocal load to vocal demand though there are relations there we want to just leave the literature as it is vocal load and vocal loading to say that in this future these definitions which we have we're going to define something that is called vocal demand as something that is called vocal demand response. And here are our definitions, and I'm gonna go over those in just a second. Um, vocal demand, vocal demand response, vocal effort, and vocal fatigue, okay. In the paper, and we did this so we can try to convey uh, the points a little bit better. 
we used a common occupational example of a school teacher lecturing in a space where you have listeners, students. Um, the space can have more noise and the talker may respond, the vocalist may respond to the elevated noise, may change their pitch, may modify their spectrum and so on. And so we use everything in terms of that example, but then that example really can be translated into multiple different communication situations. Um, and uh, so, that, so it's not just for teachers. So let me kind of hit these definitions really quickly. The paper goes into more detail. The last section of the paper uh, is something that we, we try to write it so it could be just kind of copied and hand to a student if you're trying to work through this without worrying about the review. Well, let me kind of walk through some of these, uh, these definitions. We'll start with vocal demand. Vocal demand, we define it as the demand or requirement for a given communication scenario. What we mean by that is you walk into a room where they're seeing you have to speak. There's a demand that exists to communicate. That demand is independent of what your ability is to vocalize. So there is a person or a microphone it needs to pick up a certain amount of content that can flow through to it and it must overcome whatever noise floor that's in there or whatever kind of attention that the listener has. That is the demand. Now, how you vocalize in that demand is your response to the demand. And so that your response is, in, is related to the demand, but is not the demand itself. You respond, in fact, you may respond differently every time you walk into the same demand situation, which is one of the variabilities we run into when we try to do acoustics, is people produce slightly different variations. That's their response to a given goal, which is a demand, or an instruction set, which is a demand, or a noise lombard, which is a demand. Now, and two vocalists may not do that, may not satisfy that demand the same way. One may use more vibrato, may use more modulation, maybe use more uh, um, articulation, more uh, changes the spectrum of the voice. So these are all in response to a communication scenario. That is their vocal demand response. Vocal effort is what the vocalist perceives the exertion is. It is not what someone guesses or rates the vocalist doing. That's a different rating. This is what the exercise science literature and how they've gone is the effort is the perception of the exertion by the person doing the task of the perceived event. Vocal fatigue we've kind of put off as a little bit separate, like I said earlier, um, because it is more of a result or a kind of an experience. And we, and we, Put, we defined it as vo the vocal fatigue as the quantifiable decline in function that influences the vocal to task performance and is individually specific depending on physiology. And the paper goes into much more detail of these um, concepts. Now let me hit this as kind of wrap up. As I hit before, Bart Brody kind of showed they have this variations. We, for his dissertation, we worked really hard trying to, how do we reduce the variability and using some of these new concepts and, and the work we did, I, I've seen a lot of work, but this is some of the most fun and exciting stuff that we're going to be putting out for a couple of years analysis. He did where his, the concept really was, you pull fatigue out of it, and so you define fatigue a little differently. You define it in terms of these other concepts. The change in vocal performance or vocal demand response, vocal effort, and their interaction between the two, when they face a demand, will implicate fatigue. So it is the, resp is the interaction between effort and the response within some load. And so he did a series of studies that tried to work on these. And for the first one was how reliable is doing effort over and over again. And he found that it was quite reliable across multiple people. That effort is something that people can relate their own experience of 
by using a Borg 100 scale is actually surprisingly reliable. We also you put them in where we're using some of our unique facilities where we try to use equivalent loads or equivalent demands and try to compare distances of the talkers. We try to compare it with different noises where in each one of them we're looking at their demand response because of a demand and how they were rating their effort. And even with the goal effect, that was really cool. And then finally, he even did a, a loading task or a demand task, which traditionally has been called the loading task, where we reduce the variability by having it all pre-programmed, whereas people came in and they were trained by the computer and were given instructions and they worked all of the details through. Let me hit you a couple of results. We saw results similar to what everybody else has seen, where there wasn't a lot of, we saw that there was some change over time because of this task, but it, but it, was, it was very variable. There wasn't a lot of reasons that we could depend on until we started being able to break people up because we started looking at the interactions. And when we looked at the interactions, we could start seeing some groupings. And that became very powerful. And when we started seeing the groupings, now the change over time of, the, of this task, we now had multiple people where now some of them didn't change and others, we had large changes. We went a step further and we were able to show very significant results. Well, actually Mark did, Mark did all the heavy lifting. I was there just a cheerleader most of the time. Um, very significant results when we divided people into four groups. Those that had a large voice change or no voice change or low voice change. And on the other axis where they had a large vocal response to the demand, a high response or no response using the effort. And so we use that combination of it isn't just the voice change, you can measure acoustically, and it isn't just their perception of effort, it had to be the combination. And when we had that, the results were clear. I mean, they always have a couple of outliers, but the cleanest results I've seen in any loading and trying to understanding what's going on and distinguishing people in these groups. And once we can define them in these groups, then we can actually do some real work with it. Okay, so what's our take home? I don't know if I've really redefined vocal fatigue, but I at least hope I've put it in a new light. The perspective is that to understand vocal fatigue, it's really the interaction between vocal demand and vocal demand response and vocal effort, all of them together. And the definitions really matter. We gotta get better definitions. If you wanna update these, fine. Do it. But we have to get better and we have to use definitions that we can work across uh, across our papers and our studies. And then once we have de definitions, well, we can really define, we can do metrics that fit these definitions. Um, and then there's kind of the definition again, of it's really we're looking at the change in the demand response, vocal and vocal effort and their interactions to get to vocal fatigue. All right, I'd just like to thank my colleagues, my lab. Mark has done a lot of work. Uh, all my, my, my work family, my lab family, my real family who have all really treated me nicely. But that's it. I've spoken enough. Thanks, Nancy.